Welcome to the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions in our Sustainability Talk Series. My name is David Hart. I'm the director here. It's great to have you with us. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Nelson Odume. Nelson's a professor and director of the Institute for Water Research at Rhodes University in South Africa. So he's a long way from home. Fortunately, one of the Mitchell Center's faculty fellows, Dave Portemanche, helped to make it possible for Nelson to visit us while he's in the United States as a visiting research scholar at Michigan State University. Although Dave isn't able to be here with us today, uh, I want to express my deep appreciation for his help with today's talk and all the other ways he has supported the Mitchell Center for many, many years. Now, even though I just met Nelson this morning, I instantly felt that we were kindred spirits. He's an outstanding freshwater scientist who's focused on the sustainable management of water resources, but he's much, much more than that. He's also leading innovative programs that build close partnerships between research and society, as you'll hear. Nelson described to me the important role that the African philosophy of Ubuntu plays in his work. Ubuntu emphasized the interconnectedness, interconnectedness of individuals with both society and nature. And when he described this ethical framework to me, it reminded me of the wonderful presentation that Bonnie Newsom gave in this room three weeks ago. She's a citizen of the Penobscot Nation and an indigenous archeologist. And she talked about the new Center for Grading Indigenous Knowledge and Science that she's helping to lead, particularly the focus of that center on, quote, solving problems at the nexus of nature and culture. And so that's that same interconnectedness that she was talking about, right? So Nelson is a great example of the kinds of outstanding leaders who are emerging at universities all over the world. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? So, by way of introduction, South Africa is uh, a water scarce country. And as you can see from this map, part of South Africa is um, is a desert. Actually, if you if you hear, you're actually sitting on the Kalahari Desert. Okay, and you can see that as you move. And the variability within the country is quite enormous, and that means that the way we manage water and the amount of water that is available, the physical availability of water is actually a challenge because the average evaporation is far higher than precipitation. Okay. So this means that the way we look at water and the way we manage water has to be very clear. Okay. And therefore, the, this physical scarcity of water imposes on the country some kind of developmental challenges. And some of which I'm going to be speaking to today. This map tells you the variability of climate and climate change in the country over a period of years. And what you can see is that uh, in most part of the country, we are really, really experiencing climate change and dry, extended dry period. Okay. Extended dry period. But what is also important is that increasingly, when it rains in part of the country where we experience much rainfall, the intensity of rain, very short period of rainfall, means that uh, low lying areas are flooded and houses are flooded, bridges are flooded. So on the one hand, you tend to experience dry months, drought, but on the other hand, when it rains, the intensity of rainfall in part of the country cause uh, localized flooding. Okay. So climate change and variability, but on top of this population growth and economic development, is imposing on the country demand, which means demand that is now a stripping supply. But at the same time, pollution and ecosystem degradation is becoming a problem in South Africa. 
and I was just having a discussion during lunch time. Yeah, was saying that the, the, the infrastructure in the country, because of systemic governance failure, infrastructures that decay, especially our wastewater treatment work. And because of that, there is a release of poorly treated effluent into receiving rivers. And due to this, ecosystem degradation and pollution is also a serious problem. Coupled with budgetary constraints and capacity gaps that exist in government departments. So with all these challenges, we really have to innovate in terms of how we manage and govern water resources in the country. So just a brief introduction of how we currently think about how we want to govern or manage water resources in the country. So for every bit of water that we have in the country, you have to do by law, you have to do what we call a management class. So every significant water resource in the country is classified into one of three management classes, class one, class two, and class three. Okay. Yeah, class one implies that that water, that water resource is to be protected or afforded a high priority protection. Okay. And class three means that you can develop more, so priority is given to development over protection. Okay, so it's a way of balancing the use and protection of water resources in the country. So once the management class has been determined, you have to then do what we call eco-classification or ecological categorization. So you will have to then determine and classify, categorize your water resources into class A, uh, category A, B to E slash F. Where A means that the water body is natural, and uh, E slash F means that uh, this water body is critically modified or impacted. Okay. Once you have determined your management class and your ecological category, you will have to do what we call resource quality objectives. Resource quality objectives are measurable, descriptive, or quantitative goals. So if you were to achieve a management class, how do you know that you are achieving? You have to set goals. And these goals are set in terms of quantity on the flow, how much water, the flow regime, the frequency, and all of that. You also have to set your quality indicators. You also have to set your indicators based on Fish, the response variable, fish, macroinvertebrate, and riparian vegetation. So for every management class, you have description of what that actually means in terms of the goals, the desired goals that you want to manage towards. And these goals are described in terms of the flow, hydrology, in terms of chemistry, in terms of fish, macroinvertebrate, and riparian vegetation. So that is the desired goal that you want. You have the description for every water resource. The question that then arises is, on the one hand, you have set up your goals. This is what we want our water body to look like. This is the, this is the desired future that we want our water, quality, uh, water body to achieve. How do you then achieve that? That is where you have to impose regulation. And one of the instruments for regulation is compulsory licensing. So you have to license users of water. Okay. Compulsory licensing. And I'm giving this introduction because part of the talk, if I had my first case study, linked very well to this. And you have to remember this story. On the one hand, you want to protect your water body. You have set a goal. River Mississippi, in this particular subcatchment of the river, you want to protect it at a management class one 
an ecological category B. So you want to leave it at being largely natural. And you have described that in terms of the flow, in terms of quality, in terms of diversity of fish, diversity of macroinvertebrates, and the integrity of the riparian vegetation. Now you have a development that is about to happen on that catchment. How do you then achieve the protection? You have to then impose limits on how much water that can be abstracted, the kind of the quality of waste that can be discharged into the re receiving body of water, and then measure your fish, how they are responding, your macroinvertebrates, and riparian vegetation. So come the story. So what happened was that in one of the catchments in South Africa, located in Johannesburg area, so uh, Johannesburg is the economic heart of South Africa, okay? There was this industry that was abstracting water, one of the, in fact, one of the biggest employers of labor in South Africa, and then the Department of Water and Sanitation, which will be equivalent to your national regulatory body, impose water restriction by way of lances on this particular industry. Okay. Then the industry came back to the department to say, hey, how did you arrive at the condition you have imposed on us? How did you derive the standard, the water quality standard in the lances, because if we are to meet this standard, we will have to spend billions upgrading our treatment facility. So I call this case study contestation of water quality use and management in the lower section of the upper bar catchment. So the diagram, you see, the, the photos you see here are the two reports that we produce based on that particular study. So what happened was that we had then the department, which is the government on the one hand, and the user on the other hand, the industry user, agreed that the best way to resolve this was to approach the university to do a study on what it means to impose this kind of lances, the contribution of the industry to the waste load in the river, and what might happen even if the industry were to meet the standard? So we went and do scenario modeling, develop studies and develop methodology to try and understand what the issues were. Now, the development, you can, you can then understand that uh, when, you, when you are called upon to work in this kind of environment, this is not just a scientific study. It is a scientific study to the extent that it is also a study that you have to engage with policymakers, you have to engage with industry practitioners, you have to engage with the communities. Why try to navigate a politically charged environment? How did we then went about it? The first was to try and conceptualize this study as a socio-ecological system study. So we engage with the different actors and stakeholders in the catchment. We try to understand what the issues were, why they were contesting the water quality standard. We also try to understand the other users within the catchment and engage with them. And then we, we also try to understand what is it that might also impact on water quality within this particular highly developed catchment. So once that is done, jointly together with the various stakeholders, we develop what we call the terms of preference of the study through a consultative manner because the study was arising from contestation of water quality use and management. Through that consultative process, we now understood quite clearly what the issues were. The first issue that we identified was that 
there was contestation around the scientific credibility and the possibility of water use lances method. Okay. There was contestation around how the standard in the water use lances were linked to the goals for the water resource. Remember my story earlier that for every water body, you have to have desired goals, which we call the ROQOs, resource quality objectives. Resource quality objectives. But there was also contestation around how the standard in the lances that has been issued to the industry are linked to flow and waste load. There was also contestation around impact of upstream waste load on downstream users and their lances condition. Because we're talking about a highly developed catchment. So the question arises, how does the lances you have issued to this particular industry take account of the waste load coming from upstream to downstream? Okay. And finally, the relationship between flow and water quality. So once we have finished all the consultation, we decided how do we then proceed? The way we decided to proceed was through a consultative process where, because of this kind of study, as scientists, we want to remain neutral, but at the same time, we want to engage and understand what the issues were because we've been drawn into this to resolve a potentially disastrous uh, court case, if I may put it that way. So what we did, the first thing that we did was through a consultative process, we tried to understand what a system is. So we did a system diagram of the entire catchment, and this system diagram is a very simplistic representation of how the different catchment, sub catchment within the system interact, the different water users, and how much waste each of the water users were imputing into the system, and how much waste was being assimilated, how much waste was being transported or diffused. And then once we understood the cash, the, the system diagram, we went back to say, does this represent what you understood by the, connect, the different connectivity within the cashment? In fact, the first diagram we drew, we left this and this and this out. And then the stakeholder came back to say, hey, you've actually left out a lot. Okay, you've left out a lot. This diagram you've drawn, does not represent completely the system. So we went back and then we drew another diagram and then everybody was happy that indeed this is a good diagram that represents the system. Then we set up to try and develop methodology and how to model the system. So we, I'm not gonna explain this, but this, this is just a, 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 a a simplistic representation of the water quality system assessment model that was developed to try and understand the system in terms of water quality modeling, which integrate both flow and quality. So what we did was to then develop what we call a decision support system. Now the decision support system that we develop tried to model how wastewater discharge standard impact on the, the, the goals, the eastern goals that you've actually set. Remember the contestation is that on the one hand, the government have to try and meet the desired goals set for the water resource. So the desired goals can be in terms of nutrients, aluminum, and different kinds of chemical variables as well as flow, fish, macroinvertebrate. So we wanted to link, if you were to discharge S amount of waste 
into the resource. How will that impact on the goals? Very, very important. This is just a screenshot of the support system that we develop, which is now being used both by the government in terms of understanding how water quality should be, water quality licensing should work, and also the industry. Just to even emphasize that after this work, the industry has actually come back for more work because this was certain, this is the first time that in South Africa, something like this was being developed through a consultative process, which arises because of water quality is being contested by both the users and the regulators. So let's go very quickly to what actually happened in terms of what we find through that process. The diagram, the, the graph that you see here, the, the, the red, so your, your blue line, your blue line is the goals, okay? So if you take this, your TDS, okay? TDS here is about um, 600 milligram per liter. So take your TDS as the goal, okay, in a frequency distribution curve, form of a frequency distribution curve. Total dissolved solid. Total dissolved solid. So in this particular case study, in this particular area, we, 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 we said, okay, if TDS, we are set at 520 milligram per liter, okay? And assuming the water quality standard in the lances for the industry is set at 917 milligram per liter, what happened? Okay, how much, by how much will the waste be released into the resource we exceed the goals that you want to meet. And what we observe is that you're going to exceed the goal by 31% of the time. So 31% of the time, you're going to exceed the goal. Okay. And then we said, okay, what happened if you were to we, if the government we had to reduce the standard by half. So from 917 milligram per liter to 458 milligram per liter, what will happen? We realize that actually you are still going to exceed the goal by about 28% of the time. Then we, we ask the question, what will happen if this particular industry was to be lifted out of the catchment and is no longer emitting into the system? It doesn't make any much difference. So you, you're still not going to meet your desired goals. Okay. So this is the power of consultative study. At the end of the day, we realize that actually why that particular emitter is playing a major role, the major problem within the catchment are from diffuse sources. Diffuse sources and other smaller, especially from informal settlements, wastewater treatment works, and all of that. So at the end of the day, the government and the industry decided to work out a solution through negotiation. Okay. Because the study has proven that actually, if you were to lift the industry out of that particular cash med, you are still not going to meet your desired goals. So let's move on to the second case study. In South Africa, as some of you will know, South Africa has come emerged from an apartheid system where majority of the population were deprived of access to economic opportunity. And this was true in the agricultural sector. So government has 
enacted various policies and laws that promote access to economic opportunity through equity imperatives. So this particular case study is about government policy that wants marginalized or marginalized farmers, we, uh, we call them emerging farmers in South Africa, emerging farmers. So when you hear emerging farmers, they are mainly black, historically disadvantaged, historically underprivileged farmers. So the idea is that government want them to participate actively in the agricultural sector and to transform them into commercial sustainable farmers. Okay, is that working? Is that happening? What are the issues? So on the one hand, government is trying to promote equity in the farming sector, okay? So let's look at what actually happened. In this particular case study, so the Lower Sundance River in South Africa is located somewhere here in the Eastern Cape. What is interesting about the Lower Sunday is that the entire catchment is dominated by citrus farmers. Okay, so citrus farming is quite a huge issue, but the water that is being used for irrigation in this particular system is coming from Lesotho. It's coming through into very vast and sophisticated interbasin transfer scheme from the Orange River to the Great River onto where the Lower Sundays River is. Okay, so the water is being exported, if I may use that word, it's being exported from Lesotho through interbasin transfer scheme. Now, this much of this water is used mainly for irrigation of citrus. And within the Lower Sundays River, we have what we call the Water User Association. So the Water User Association is the local water governance institution responsible for water allocation. Okay, water allocation and distribution. Now the government, what it did was they set aside water for emerging farmers within this Lower Sunday River catchment. So if you go to the Lower Sunday River catchment, you have commercial farmers who are mainly white. Now, because the government wanted the black, historically disadvantaged farmers to participate, what they did was to set aside an amount of water for these emerging farmers. Okay. So the equity goal was that they wanted these farmers to participate in the farming system. Was that working? Did it work or not? We're going to get to know about that. But before I get there, the piece of legislation in South Africa that regulates water, which is what we call the National Water Act, the National Water Act 1998, has three fundamental principles or what I call values. And these three fundamental principles are equity. So equity is fundamental in the way we think and see water in South Africa. And of course, you have to appreciate that in the context of the history of the country. Efficiency and sustainability. So when we were doing this work, we said, look, let's try and interrogate. Let's try and interrogate how equity has been conceptualized in the legislation. Let's try and understand how government is seeing and thinking about equity. So in this particular study, we look at, we see equity as a way to ensure that water governance processes and outcome of those processes are fair and inclusive, okay? It means that we treat the governance processes as participatory and affirming of the vulnerable and disadvantaged in the society. And we think that equity has four dimensions. So dimensions of equity, the distributive equity dimension, the procedural equity dimension, what we call the recognition equity, and the contextual equity. 
So what do I mean by distributive? Distributive equity has to do with fairness in terms of access to water resources, fairness in terms of distribution of risk and burden and opportunities associated with water resources. Whereas procedural equity is talking about fairness in terms of participation in the decision-making processes that actually influence who has access to water and who does not have access to water. Okay. Whereas recognition equity is talking about fairness in terms of affirming the identity, the diversity of identities of people in the room who are making decisions or participating. And contextual is talking about sensitivity to the contextual reality, whether social, whether economic, political, or historical, that may impose on people the ability to either assess opportunity or not, or be able to participate in the decision-making processes or not. So when we did this analysis, we realized that actually in terms of the piece of legislation, more of the attention has been given to distributive equity and less on the other dimension. Okay. Then in the analysis, we wanted to also understand the target of equity. So in this particular case study, the target of equity is who actually count as an equity candidate. In this sense, we are the emerging farmers. Who count as an e equity candidate? And at what scale is equity operating? Okay. For this analysis, it was at the farm scale or irrigation schemes. So let's look at what happens. Like I described earlier, the goal of equity in this particular catchment was that uh, government wanted active participation of emerging farmers, historically disadvantaged groups, mainly black in agriculture. And the government has allocated water, and this is interesting, Government allocated, set aside the amount of water for the historically black. Okay, so this is the water. You can now participate in farming. Okay, this is the water. You can participate in the farming system. Not so easy. Not so simple. Let's see. Why government has set aside the amount of water for the black farmers, they've not done the same in terms of land. They've not then done the same in terms of other necessary ingredients to do farming. So government is putting equity goals by setting aside water for black farmers, but farming is beyond just water. Okay, this is what you see here. What you see here is an example of black farmers partnering with white farmers so that there's transfer of skills. Okay, there are some good examples of that, but it has not always worked well. Why you are pursuing equity goals? It is also imperative that we look at efficiency because we, through this study and through the consultative process, we realize that actually it is not possible to achieve equity without efficiency. But in what way we equity interacting with efficiency in this particular case study? So we, we conceptualize efficiency in this sense as um, concerning itself with optimization of input resources for the greatest possible outcomes, okay? And it focuses mainly on the input and outcome and less on the end, okay? So we look at efficiency from multiple dimensions, technical efficiency, allocative efficiency, and productive efficiency. I'm going to skip on the sustainability. So we wanted to understand how, because government, our worry was that 
And the worries of the emerging farmer was that the government was pursuing equity goal without thinking about what else might impact on equity, particularly efficiency. So we develop together a, a very simple framework of, first of all, looking at the various ways in which equity and efficiency and sustainability may interact. One, we think that there are occasions where, as you pursue, as you pursue equity goals, that may come into conflict with efficiency. So when we think about equity, efficiency, and sustainability in South Africa, we always think that we can achieve all of them at the same time. It is now becoming clear that it's not as simple as that. If you single-mindedly pursue one of the goals, if you pursue an equity goal, very soon or not, you're going to land yourself in trouble with efficiency unless you think about how they interact very carefully along the line. But there are also times, if you pay attention, there are times where equity goals may enhance efficiency. So it's not always conflict. So there are times that both equity and efficiency may interact in what we call mutuality. But there are times that may be neutral. So in this particular case study, I have said that the equity agenda was that the government wants to support the establishment of resource poor farmers or emerging farmers in the lower Sundays River, and they wanted to make them viable commercial farmers. That has not worked well. In fact, we have failed. We're not achieving it. We're not achieving this equity goal. Okay. When we work with these particular emerging farmers, we realize that the majority of the emerging farmers supported so far have failed. Why? These are some of what they are saying. In fact, we realize that a lot of the emerging farmers are unable to run an efficient operation to pay both fixed and variable cost associated with farming. Okay. Look at what some of the, one, one of them says. So once you have once you are allocated land and water, the bills begin to run. By bills, you have to pay for the water. As soon as you start using the water, so government set aside water for you, it does not mean that that water is free. As soon as you start using it, you have to pay. Okay. So the bills begin to run. Whether you use it or not, you, you are still required to pay, and this is not helping. So on the one hand, government wants to encourage equity, set aside water for black farmers to irrigate. But at the same time, government wants these black farmers, emerging farmers, to start paying for the water base immediately. So there is no time. As soon as you start using the water, you pay. Okay? And this is not helping. So what we see there, government wants to be efficient because you have to be able to re recover cost in order to develop your water infrastructure. So the goal of equity and efficiency will come into conflict. Now we think that for the emerging farmers to be successful, they need training. So there has to be training, there has to be technical support, infrastructure and access to market. But in the way in which equity goals were being contextualized, all of these variables were not being accounted for. Now, if the emerging farmer were to be successful, there will be need for training, there will be a need for investment, and some of this investment may seem inefficient at the beginning. You know, so remember, you, you're trying to encourage somebody who has not who has no history of farming. You know, no, you know, previous generation, they have not been farming. And now you want to turn them into farmers, successful farmers at that. 
large-scale farmers is not going to happen overnight. So you're going to invest at the beginning, and if you are not careful, you will think your investment is just a waste. But you just have to be patient. You just have to keep doing it properly. And over time, the efficiency will come in. But it's our goal, is the goal, the conceptualization and pursuit of equity seems to know that government was not paying attention or even understanding what it means to pursue equity goals. So what, at the end of the day, what we realize is that the interaction between equity and efficiency is mediated by a number of factors, which the policy that seems to be encouraging equity was not paying attention to. The first is that equity, is medi equity goes are mediated by time, the time scale. And what do we mean by that? If you take somebody who has not been farming and you expect them to become efficient now, it is not going to work. Okay, it is not going to work. You have to keep supporting and investing and over time, with the right enabling environment in place, they will become what? Efficient. But we were not seeing it that way. Government was not seeing it that way. So the short-term versus long-term goal. So we think that equity has to be construed as a long-term goal. Okay? And you have to be able to develop indicators to track progress towards equity goal. So instead of construing equity as a short-term goal, you have to construe equity as a long-term goal with short-term, medium-term, and long-term indicators of progress, at least in this particular context in which we are working. The second aspect that mediates equity and efficiency interaction was what we call agency and capability development. You want the emerging farmers to be efficient because you want them to meet your equity goals, but at the same time, you're not paying sufficient attention to the technical capacity training and capability building that is necessary. So it's like throwing somebody into the deep sea and say, look, you want to swim? This is your swimming pool. You can swim now. But you've not trained me how to swim. You have to do that. Okay. You have to do that. Secondly, you also have to be willing. So training and doing all of this will require some resources and investment. You have to be willing to put in the amount of time and investment, whether financial investment or time investment or labor investment or whatever. You have to be willing to put in that. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So it's not enough to say, hey, equity goes, black farmers take this is the water, go and farm. And then you ignore the other part of that mediates the sources of failure of that enterprise. But also multi-level governance. To what extent we have black farmers in this particular catchment capacitated to participate at different scales of governance that impact on water and agriculture. Okay, and finally, the context in which this equity and efficiency we are interacting, very, very important. We need to look at the social economic context, the technological context, the environmental context. As you know, farming requires some technology. We are this being provided, no. So at the end of the day, through this study, we realized that actually we were we did not actually fully understood what equity was. It is not a shy play. When you set yourself up to achieve equity goals, it's a huge, huge mission. It is not just these are the targets. You really have to be willing to invest the time, 
the resources you have to be able to understand the time it takes to achieve these equity goals. So my, the last part of my talk is just some of the lessons and the ways in which we've done this project. These projects are heavily embedded in communities. These are not just technical projects. These are projects that you have to work with communities, you have to work with policymakers, you have to work with practitioners first to understand the issues, to try and develop joint solutions. So I usually use this as the three, uh, the three tripods of stakeholders that we normally are engaged with in this kind of project. On the one hand, you have communities. On the second hand, you have practitioners, mostly the policymakers, industry, and practice. And then on the other hand, you have the academics. Now, your practitioners comes with what I call practice-based knowledge. Okay, they comes with practice-based knowledge. Your academics come with knowledge, academic knowledge embedded in different disciplines. And then you have your communities mostly coming with what I call place-based knowledge. Place-based knowledge. When we do this kind of research, I start from pro what I call problem co-identification with the stakeholders. What is it that we want to do? Okay, so you go into the field, you as an academic, you go into the field with an open mind. You don't know, they actually know better than you. So with that mind, openness, ask the question, what are the problems, what are the challenges, and how can we work together, okay? So problem co-identification phase. From there, we do what we call problem co-structuring and, and analysis. So through that engagement, we try to understand better what the problems are, and then begin to structure the problem, and then from there, we go into project co-design. From project co-design into project co-implementation. And mostly this the project that I've presented to you involve stakeholders, communities, and, and um, academic students collecting data together. Okay interrogating the questions together. Then from there, application and uptake. Now this application and uptake is quite interesting because it doesn't really, it's not actually a phase, but as you structure the problem together, there is something that is already happening because you're doing it together with the communities and stakeholders, okay? And then co-dissemination. So if you do this kind of research, there are, inherent risk and politics that you have to pay attention to, what I call risk and politics of knowledge co-production, because you are co-producing knowledge. The third is what I call power, okay? And power manifests in different ways. So power manifests in terms of the various academic disciplines that are involved. You are working with social scientists, humanities, natural sciences. The question that arises is which of these knowledge forms and knowledge systems is legitimized in the process of the project? So there's always that tension for leg of legitimization between the different disciplines. Okay, so we need to pay attention to, 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 to the tension that arises between natural sciences and social sciences and humanities, and then academic versus practice-based knowledge. In the framing of the project, and even in constructing the project, which knowledge is being legitimized between the academic knowledge and practice-based knowledge? And in terms of our experience from Africa, Western-derived epistemologies versus African epistemologies and thought. In most cases, you have theories and concepts that are derived through Western thought being imposed on the African context. So we use this, we take, we go to Africa and test and use Africa as case study for Western derived concepts. And that is power. 
it is really has to do with power because it tells you which knowledge system is being legitimized or seen as authentic knowledge. But there's also the global versus global north versus global south. With this kind of um, with this kind of uh, co-production knowledge systems, there's also the level of participation and intent. Okay, so this 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 is a very good uh, what I call a, a a ladder of citizen participation. Why are you involving citizens or why are citizens participating in the research? Okay, so from participation for participation's sake to ownership. So it will, it will be interesting to, to look at, at this. But very important is avoiding what I call extracting research, extracting research. Okay, so research actually say you are an academic, you go into a community, you add what do you do, what do you do, you collect the data. You publish them, you don't give anything back. Some of the lessons that we've learned very quickly. One, how do you achieve what I call conceptual threshold crossing with publishing paper in environmental science and policy that share some of these lessons? Conceptual threshold crossing. So what that means is you're working with different disciplines, you're working with different academics, you're working with different communities, each speaking with different jargons. How do you understand what different people are saying and understand that? Two, this kind of research are resource, resource intensive in terms of time, finance, people, and logistics. And finally, what I call walking the last mile. How do you avoid fatigue? Whether intellectual fatigue, conceptual fatigue, and participation fatigue. We think that you have to build enough redundancy in your system. Enough redundancy in terms of people, in terms of ideas, and in terms of resources. I will leave it here. Thank you. So I just want to say um, uh, this was a wonderful talk, covered a lot. There may be people in the room who are interested in asking some questions, but because we're at time, I'm going to have to stop it here. And I know Linda has got some things from the Zoom audience, and so maybe you can come share those as well. So let's thank Nelson one more time.